Hey YouTube, we've all seen this thing. This is Result, Rust's efficient type safe answer to exception handling in other languages. We all know it's powerful. You may even know there's like this question mark thing you're supposed to use that makes it even more powerful. But for many Rust developers, it has this intimidating air around it. Maybe it's the two type parameters. Maybe it's the mere fact that code that needs to handle errors is more complex than code that doesn't. But in this video, I hope to give you a mental model for Result that shows that it's simpler than you might have thought. And then we'll also talk about some tricks for using it fluently. This won't be a result tutorial from scratch, by the way. There are many great resources about result, including the official Rust documentation. But I hope that you take what I present today as some added nuance for your existing understanding of result. My perspective is just one perspective on things, and I hope this video helps you round out your own. So let's start just by looking at it. Here it is, and this is fairly similar to the real definition. Notice that there are no trait bounds on T or E, they're just whatever types you want. Just by looking at this definition, we can make an important observation about result. It's a sum type, just like all other enums in Rust. To demonstrate what that means real quick, let's substitute some types in for T and E. For our type T, I'm going to use bool. For E, I'm just going to use unit. So let's write down all the possible OK values of this result type. So the set of all OK values is OK true and OK false. Now, if we take the cardinality of that set, in other words, if we count up the number of elements in that set, it's two. So set that two aside. And let's do the same thing for the air variant. Well, the only possible air variant is air unit. There's only one possible error value. So what a sum type means is we can count up the number of possible values of result bool unit by adding together all the possible OK values and all the possible air values. So that's three. So there are three possible values of type result bool unit. Now let's pause for a second. This particular example might remind you of another sum type in the standard library, which is option. If we look at option bool, the set of all possible values of option bool also has a cardinality of three. There are two possible sum values, and there's only one possible none value. In fact, not only do these types have the same number of possible values or inhabitants, they also share structural similarities. The OK variant of result kind of corresponds to the sum variant of option. And an air unit value is very much like the unit none variant of option. So we can take this a step further and actually say that result, where the error type is a unit type, is isomorphic to option. In other words, they can carry equivalent information as each other, and in particular, you can losslessly convert from one to the other and vice versa. More on that in a bit. Now, this isomorphism only exists between options and results where the error is a unit type. But if we step back and consider that relationship more broadly, I'm going to claim that result is just a generalization of option where there might be more than one way of saying none, or less than one way. Stick around to the end. Taking that statement in the other direction, option is just a special case of result where there's only one self-explanatory reason that the value might be missing. Of course, there are some differences. One is that result is must use where option is not. And some will argue that what I'm saying here is overly simplistic, and that's fair. But I hope to show you that this mental model can actually get you surprisingly far. To help this sink in, let's look at some standard library APIs through this lens. So here's HashMap get. HashMap get takes a key and returns an optional reference to the value associated with that key. Now, obviously this can fail if the key isn't present in the map. So something the standard library could have done is define an actual error type for this function, a unit struct called key not found, and return a result from this function that explains the cause of the error. But notice here, there's only one possible cause of the error. The key wasn't found. There's only one self-explanatory reason this function can fail. So it's a little clearer and a little less noisy to return an option which conveys either success or failure for some reason that's probably obvious to the caller. On the other hand, look at from UTF-8 from the std stir module. This takes a byte slice and converts it to a string slice if and only if the bytes are valid UTF-8. Now, this function could have returned an option instead of a result. It could have returned some string if the conversion was successful and none if it wasn't. But there is more than one reason why some bytes might not be valid UTF-8. In fact, there are basically infinite reasons. So not only would it be frustrating as the caller to not be able to see what went wrong, it would kind of just be dishonest to use option. Since option says, hey, I don't have a value to return to you, and you implicitly understand why. Instead, this API returns a result where the error variant holds a type that identifies which of the infinite possible reasons it was that caused this function to fail. 
So we should model our APIs in the same way. And you might pause for a moment and reflect on what functions you've written that return options that should maybe return results instead, and vice versa. A rule of thumb is that if you write a function that returns none along multiple separate paths, that probably means there's more than one reason you're returning none, and you should maybe capture those multiple reasons using a result with more than one state in its error variant. On the other hand, if you have a function that can fail in only one obvious way, see this function that tries to fetch from a database and fails with an error saying it wasn't there, it might be cleaner to just use option instead. Although for the record, I personally have actually written code like this, where I wanted my function signature to be more self-documenting, so I returned a result with a unit error type, which essentially amounts to returning an option, but giving none a better name, even though this one's missing an apostrophe. Since we're talking about result and option sort of being two flavors of the same larger concept, let's touch on converting between them. So while result with a unit error is isomorphic to option, that's not generally true for all possible error types. In general, result can hold more information than option. So in general, converting to an option from a result is going to be lossy. And you do it with the OK method. You can read this method as give me the value inside the OK variant, which returns you an option T. And this makes sense in our new mental model. There's only one obvious reason this function can fail, and that's if you don't have an OK value. So if you have an OK value, you get some T, and if you don't, you get none. On the other side, if we want to convert an option to a result, we generally also need to provide extra information about what should go in the error variant if the option doesn't have a value. OK or else is usually a good default since it only computes the error value if it's actually needed, but OK or can be simpler and cleaner if your error type is trivially cheap to construct. So now that we have this mental model in mind, let's get some practice using result effectively. For this next section, we're going to be working with a function called fallible that takes a u8 and returns a result of string or some error type e. For extra credit, pay attention to which parts of this next section would be different and how if we were using option instead. So let's say that I have a new type struct, w, that just wraps a string. And I want to write a constructor for w that takes a u8, calls fallible on it, and uses that as the inner string. Here's fallible as a reminder. So clearly this constructor can fail because it's calling fallible, which can fail. So it needs to return a result of self. And now the implementation is straightforward. This is just a map that wraps the return string in self if it's there and returns the error that occurred otherwise. Pretty simple. Now let's see what happens if we want to add another parameter and call fallible on it as well and store that in w alongside the first string. Our implementation no longer works, obviously. So how do we now deal with two results, both of which could individually fail? Well, one option is to write it like this, chaining one fallible after another in this sort of combinator mess. This isn't terrible, but you could definitely see this getting out of hand, especially if we needed to, you know, add another parameter at some point. It would be nice if there were a better solution. Now, if you've used a result before, you're probably yelling at your screen right now, and I know exactly what you're thinking. You're thinking, if only we were writing Haskell, and we could use do notation in the either monad. And honestly, you have a really good point. Haskell has some very powerful syntax called do notation, where after you start a block with the keyword do, you enter this context where, in this specific situation, you can chain fallible computations together in a way that's really easy to write. You see on the right here, I have a fallible computation on x, and then there's this backwards arrow thing, and I'm sort of sticking that value into the name x prime. But the cool thing here is that the type of x prime is just string even though it's the result of this computation that can fail. When the compiler sees the backwards arrow, it inserts some code behind the scenes that reaches inside the fallible result and extracts the success value if it succeeded, or it short circuits the entire block if it fails. And then the same thing happens for y prime. So we get to use x prime and y prime happily as if no failure happened. And then on the last line, we just create a w and wrap it in a success result which is what Haskell's return function does in this context. So we get to write code almost as if no failure can happen at all, and the backwards arrow handles the boilerplate of short-circuiting if any of the fallible computations fails. Do notation is super cool, and it can do way more than just this. You should go learn about it. By the way, also for completeness, Haskell happens to have a cleaner way of doing this exact thing using applicative. But for our purposes today, it would be really nice if there were something akin to this backwards arrow that we could use in Rust. And yeah, there is. It's spelled question mark. The question mark is a unary postfix operator, so you use it like this. 
And for results, it desugars to something a lot like this. If the operand is okay, we unwrap it. And if it's an error, we return from the entire function we're in using the error value. Keep in mind the from on the return value. More on that later. Note that this whole match expression is of type T, the type inside the result. If it's okay, we reach in and grab the T out, so the okay arm has type T, and then the error arm diverges, so it doesn't really matter what its type is, since it never has to produce a value for this expression, since we're just returning from the whole function anyway. Although if you're interested, its type is actually this, which is pronounced never. It's Rust's bottom type, which is a type with no possible values, and it is a subtype of every other type in the type system, so it can implicitly convert into anything you need it to. Anyway, let's take the question mark back to our example. We can rewrite it like this, using the question mark to just unwrap or return our fallible results. Go back and compare this to the Haskell code if you're interested. It's strikingly similar. But in Rust, the question mark is slightly more powerful than Haskell's backwards arrow thing in an important way. It's an operator, so you can use it anywhere you can write an expression. In particular, we can use it here, while we're already in the process of building up an OK value. Why not? One last thing on this example. Let's say we're generalizing w to take a slice of u8s, and we want to store a vec of strings, the result of calling fallible on each one of the u8s. So how would we do that? Well, we can get started like this. We can iterate over the u8s and call fallible on each one, but then what? Then we have an iterator of results. So how do we collect that into a vec of strings? Well, result has another trick up its sleeve. It implements this. This is a mouthful, so we'll walk through it, and I'll color code it on the off chance that that helps. So if you're unfamiliar, the from iterator trait is what powers the collect method. So what this implementation is saying is, if you can collect an iterator of A's into a V, for example, an iterator of numbers into a VEC, then you can also collect an iterator of result numbers into a result VEC. And the behavior of that is that if all the results are OK, you get back an OK VEC. But if any of them fails, the whole thing fails, and you get back an error, no VEC. Note that this is similar in spirit to building up a VEC by using question mark on each of the result numbers before pushing them into the VEC. So this is a super useful impl that result has, and option has it too. So back in our example, all we have to do is call collect on our iterator. Note the turbo fish. Type inference does usually need a little bit of help here. And then we construct self with it, featuring our trusty question mark. I want to round out this discussion by talking about how to throw together a quick and effective error type for your functions that return results. This will just be a very basic demo, and it's going to have some issues. If you're designing a real error type, especially for a library, I really recommend you do your homework on how to do it well. I recommend starting with this fantastic article, Study of Stood IO Error. I'll put a link in the description. So to power this next example, Imagine a type called node, that's a node in like a tree data structure. It has one method for getting its parent. Note that this method returns an option, which makes sense, because there's only one way it can fail if the node doesn't have a parent, in other words, if it's the root. Now imagine we're trying to write a function called grandparent, that takes a node and calls parent, and then calls parent on the result of that to get the original node's grandparent. What should this function return? Well, we could start by returning an option, and we could implement it like this. Note that the question mark works for option two. But this isn't really the best version of this API. The function we're using internally can only fail in one way, but we are calling it twice. So we can fail in two ways. If we rewrite it this way and then count the question marks, we can see that clearly. So assuming our caller might care about how this function failed, and they might, we should return a result where the error is a type with two possible states since we can fail in two ways. The easiest way to do that is to write an enum with two unit variants. I've done that here. I'm also going to alias this error type to GE just to save space on screen. So back in our function, all we have to do is map the options to their respective errors using OKOR. Now this function returns as much information to the caller as might be useful to them. Remember, if they don't need it, they can always easily throw it away by converting the result to an option on their end. But if we don't return them the information in the first place, they can never get it if they do need it. So it's always better to return more information than less if there's a chance someone somewhere will care. Moving on now, let's say for a very contrived example that we're writing another function where we want to call grandparent and then write the resulting node to a file. 
So you see, we're calling grandparent, unwrapping it with question mark, then writing it to a file, propagating out any errors, also using question mark. So what kind of error type do we need in order to make this work? Well, we're dealing with two totally different types of errors here. The first line might throw an error of type GE, and the next line might throw an error of type std IO error. So what does log GP error need to look like? Well, using our intuition about some types, the possible states for our log GP error are any of the possible states of grandparent error plus any of the possible states of IO error. So an enum of the two is the correct choice. Now, in order to seamlessly support the question mark like we want to, we also need to implement the from trait for both of these sub error types so that they can convert into log GP error when we use the question mark. Remember that sneaky call to from that we saw in the question mark desugaring. So we can easily do that with the derive more crate by deriving derive more from. If you want to be a better Rust citizen though, your error type should really implement the error trait, which we haven't even talked about yet and is itself maybe a subject for another time. But instead of using derive more here, I would personally use the this error crate to derive a bunch of nice trait implementations all at once. This one derive macro handles your implementation of the error trait, those same implementations of from that we were getting from derive more a moment ago, and also implementations of display, which are customizable with these attributes. This isn't really a this error tutorial, so there's plenty more to learn here, but I'll leave it at that and put a link in the description. One thing I'll note is that this error actually complains here that we haven't implemented error for GE. It wants us to do that so it can do some fancy stuff like tracking error sources and backtraces. And I'll leave this as an exercise for the viewer, but I'll point out that this is a good reason to proactively use this error on your error types, even if you don't need it right now, since people using your type downstream might want it. But what if I don't wanna write this type at all? I'm sick of all the boilerplate, and I just want to write a function that can fail in a few different ways without having to tediously write enum variants for all of them. Well, there's another popular crate called anyhow that gives you exactly this ability. You don't need to tell it exactly what errors you might return. It'll dynamically work with any error type that implements the error trait. Using anyhow's error type is a bit like using Boxstein error, but it's a bit better. You can attach context to errors for better debuggability, and also, anyhow error is the size of a thin pointer, whereas Boxstein error is a wide pointer. Anyhow does this by implementing its own vtables for a clever performance trade-off I hope to talk about in more depth another time. But anyway, a lot of people swear by the anyhow crate. Personally, it can be convenient, but I don't mind a little boilerplate, and I much prefer the type safety and robust self-documentation that explicit error types give you. But you should choose your own adventure. The very last thing I want to mention before we end is what if you need to use result, but your code can't actually fail? This can happen when you're implementing a trait, for example. Take the from stir trait, where there's a customizable error type and a function that returns a result that uses that error type. Now let's say I want to implement from stir for a type where from stir cannot fail. You see in the body here, there are no question marks. There's no way this function can produce an error value. So what do I use for my error type? Well, one option is unit but using unit isn't quite true. Unit has one possible value, but my error type should have zero possible values. Well, the standard library has a type defined for just this situation. It's called infallible, and it's an enum with zero variance, meaning there are zero possible values of this type. It's kind of a sibling of never, and together they are Rust's bottom types. So let's use infallible for our error type. This accurately captures the fact that there are zero possible states of our error variant. To bring this discussion full circle, let's see how that manifests in result itself. A result of bool and infallible has two possible OK values and zero possible error values. Two plus zero is two, so result bool infallible has two possible states. We've sort of deleted the error variant using infallible, and our result type is now isomorphic to bool. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something new about result or gained some new perspective on something you already knew. I'd love to hear from you in the comments and I'll see you next time.